Welcome everybody to today's panel on how government OSPOs can deliver value for citizens at scale. We're delighted to be here at OSPOCon, though not in person, uh, at least we can bring these fabulous voices from all around the world to help uh, discuss this fantastic topic. You know, and we all know that there has been a recent trend in terms of uh, OSPOs or open source program offices being established in public sector um, uh, organizations. And what we're here today is to hear from some real live experiences from people who have been involved in the creation and the planning for such OSPOs or who have been working with them. So I'm delighted to welcome our panelists here today. First of all, we'll do a very quick introduction of all our panelists. I would invite you panelists to give a little wave when I mention your name, just so we know who's who, um, and we'll, we'll get started. So my name is Claire Dillon. I work with Moss Labs. We're involved and we facilitate the OSPO++ network, which is a network for OSPOs in universities and government and civic institutions. And we help them collaborate and we like to create collaborations that make it for impactful um, open source projects. So that's one of the things we do. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Bastien Guerry, who is the free software officer for the French public administration. Um, and he is involved and responsible for the free software action plan, um, which relates to OSPOs in France. So we'll be hearing from Bastien later. I'd also like to introduce Amala Kumar, who is uh, who heads up, in fact, the Tech for Social Good at GitHub, but who has a long history of working with uh, nonprofits for social good um, in the past. So she'll be giving her insights there. Welcome, Mala. Um, I'd love to say hello to Aster Numelin Karlberg, who's from Open Forum Europe, um, and he's a policy director there. So we'll be hearing from Aster shortly. I'd also love to welcome Hayes Salinas from the European Commission. Uh, he's the project officer there and is uh, working in the OSPO there. Um, and indeed, I'd love to welcome Maurizio Garol Gazzola, excuse me, Maurizio, uh, who's the Chief of Strategic Technical Sol Technology Solutions at the United Nations Office of Information and Communication Technology. Quite a mouthful, but we are delighted to have you here, Maurizio, um, and welcome to everyone here. So to get kick-started, I think it might be useful for us to have a little bit of context about why we're seeing this trend, this increase in the number of OSPOs in public sector. So I'm going to call on Aster um, to give us an overview of the report that came out that was published by the European Commission earlier this month, talking about uh, the economic impact of open source and how that relates to OSPOs. So Aster, if I can call on you to maybe just give us a very brief overview of what was included in that report. Yes, absolutely. And it, I'm also going to take the liberty to, to share just a few slides, not to break up the rhythm of this panel too much, but um, to, to give you a little bit of context, because there are some numbers here from the economic analysis that I will show. Uh, I hope you can see this all right. Okay, perfect. Well, so yeah, so like you mentioned, on the 6th of September, the European Commission published a, a, landmark, a landmark study on the impact of open source on the European economy. And I'm of course, especially happy to mention this because our think tank Open Forum Europe uh, uh, conducted this study together with uh, Fraunhofer ISI. Um, and it should also be said here that my colleagues uh, will be presenting this study uh, in detail in another uh, panel uh, at the, the Open Source Summit. So, um, but I'll give you a brief overview of the economic findings. If you have any specific questions, analysis, methodology, or whatever else, I suggest you check out that panel as well. Uh, so let me come to some of the main findings here. Um, the first one, I don't think is a surprise to most people uh, um, listening in here today. Um, open source code and components are essentially everywhere. Um, and I uh, think it's, however, good to have this empirically back in an ecosystem of, of studies and reports. Uh, just that this is a point that needs to be uh, underlined in policy discussions more and more, that it's not a fringe question, it is everywhere. Um, then secondly, um, we found, and this should be said, are very conservative figures. Uh, we work with a very conservative methodology to come to a very strong, stable, defendable number. Uh, we see open source making up uh, 0.5 to 0.7 of the EU's GDP. And so this means more or less that open source software contributes a similar value to the economy as air and water transport combined. Uh, so the third point that I wanted to raise here is that uh, 
in more of a dynamic number, if we saw an uh, increase of the globally available uh, open source code, to if they were, were to raise by 10%, we would see a, a, an increase in the EU's GDP uh, of between 04 and 0.6%, which is for an economy of 500 million people, a big number. Um, in the EU, uh, um, open source software has a cost benefit ratio of one to 10, in terms of, of investments put in and value created. Uh, if you in that number also then take into account hardware and capital costs, we'll see a ratio of one to four. Um, so good ROI on, on open source when it comes to investment. And just contextualize this in the European Commission's words, they uh, stated that they, these findings show that there are clear signals from investors on the huge value and potential of open source policies to maximize the return in Europe of this value may be required in the short term. The findings of the study will be used as a basis for policy options in many digital areas. And in the long term, the findings can be used for a new open source policy focus on the EU economy as a whole. So then we're now entering the space of talking about open source policy at scale. Um, and that brings me to uh, the question of OSPOs. Um, because we believe that OSPOs or the OSPO as an organizational construct thought about broadly in, 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 in society has the potential to realize this vast amount of value from open source or realize a vast amount of value from open source for citizens across Europe and the, and the world um, as it has or the OSPO has for companies and shareholders in the private sector. Um, so we argue that the OSPO and subsequently, and I think we'll get into this later more in detail, all networks of OSPOs should be considered as central to capacity building uh, uh, when it comes to Euro European open source. And um, this has to do with creating an institutional framework or infrastructure, if you want, onto which you can then roll out large scale open source policies. Um, so very briefly, and I'm, we'll get into a lot of these questions later on, um, but we recommend the, that the European Commission uh, uh, should consider five steps in the context of OSPOS uh, um, to increase this institutional capacity. Um, and the first part um, is giving the European Commission OSPO, uh, which we'll hear Chris talk about more, an external networking component. Now they already collaborate with people and have things. We want to boost this capacity uh, and make this a very clear, distinct uh, uh, action for 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 the, the European Commission's OSPO. Then um, we also want to see uh, uh, the European Commission OSPO being tasked and built up in a way where it can be a reference point internally. Uh, and explicitly in any digital policy that might touch on open source or open source development to be uh, a point of knowledge and, and um, uh, be part of the process of developing legislation and bringing in technical experts, etc. Then, and here's a task that uh, I have a hunch might already be planned, but it's an important one. Uh, we recommend that the European Commission also uh, identifies and maps the existing European uh, OSPOs in industry, public sector, and academia with the explicit aim uh, uh, to, to exchange information and share uh, best practices for a future European OSPO network. This is kind of a first step. And here, the kind of big investment recommendation is for uh, the European Commission through its funding instruments, um, fund pilot programs where 10 OSPOs uh, are built in the public sector and 10 in academia as a first step of kind of uh, uh, getting this development uh, going. It's already starting in some places, but to get this at scale and across Europe. Um, and with that, the, the last bit, um, which we'll have, have a chance to get into more detail later on, uh, we encourage them to establish over time uh, a formal EU OSPO network. Um, and this has brings all the earlier um, uh, recommendations together, uh, where um, uh, the EC OSPO, which we, where we see the natural home for this to be administrated, uh, together with the identified OSPOs in industry, the public sector, and academia, as well as the newly uh, built OSPOs, if this recommendation is followed, uh, to bring this together in a structured network for best practices and be able to collaborate at scale. Um, I think I ran through this quick enough. 
Um, you did so very well. There. That was that was that was that was beautiful and short. Thank you, Esther. That was that was fantastic. And and we definitely will touch back on this idea of the network um, very shortly. But before we do, I do want to go to Bastien um, and ask him about another report. So your report or the report from the European Commission, Esther, very clearly outlines the economic potential of both open source and using Osbos that may they may enable that. Um, but I think there was also a report in January of this year uh, that was made to the French in the French Parliament by Eric Botherell, and it, it it covered a, a little bit more context in terms of the value of open source beyond the economic value as well, um, or purely that 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 GDP angle. Um, Bastien, can you maybe refer to that? Uh, give us a little bit of an overview of what happened in France mm -hmm. and how that relates to Ospos for France. Yeah. Um... The, the Botterell report was mainly about open data uh, policies. It was about assessing these policies and renewing them. And open source uh, legally is part of open data in the sense of what the public sector uh, builds in terms of software. It has to release the, the, the source code. So the angle, the first angle was this one. How can we go further into publishing the source code of uh, the software that the French state is, is building. But what Botterell report says is that if we are publishing source code, then we want other administrations in France to reuse it. And if we want this administration to reuse open source, then there is a cultural shift to be made towards open source and they need to learn how to buy and uh, to acquire open source. So this is, uh, this virtuous circle that the Butterfly Report uh, sh uh, 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 draw and, and the OSPO recommendation from this report is based on that. If you put together in the same institution within the administration, the right people who understand the open source in its various dimensions, because we also recognize the diversity of the problems, then maybe you have a chance to uh, rationalize the publication and then the use of open source and in between the contribution that the public sector can make to the outside open source ecosystem. Fantastic, thank you, thank you so much. And and Hayes, I'll come to you now. You, you're sitting in the European Commission. Um, you actually have an OSPO. So so perhaps, and, and you have been one of the first public administrations to actually create an OSPO in Europe. So maybe, can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? What have been the first priorities for your OSPO in terms of, in terms of how, how, how that's come about? Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, so, and maybe first uh, clarify why uh, we started an OSPO. It's, it's really the logical outcome of an increasing importance uh, to the organization of open source. It's a relationship that dates back 20 years uh, when the data center started running its first wikis based on Linux. Um, but by now, 77% of all our hosts in the data center are Linux. And we use open source for the vast majority, like all of them but two, of the uh, commission websites and web-based projects. Um, and everything new that comes out through the website, through the websites of the commission is based on open source. And one cool example is Decidim, which we use for the uh, conference on the future of Europe conference. And so open source is such an important component for everything we do. Um, and open source is something that we increasingly share with the wider community that it has outgrown the IT department. It has become critical for almost all of the organization. And that is why um, when the commission renewed its, its view on, on how to deal with open source, its open source strategy, um, first of all, we elevated the status of the strategy to a communication to the commission, meaning it, it really was taken out of the IT department and given to all of the commission. And we created an OSPO to take charge of the strategy, basically to promote a working culture based on the principles of open source, that's for the inside, and to remove any organizational or legal barrier towards uh, open source software. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. So, so I'm going to ask a question then, because, uh, you know, obviously, Hayes, you're, you're a little bit perhaps further down the line in terms of actually having established an OSPO. Bastien, the recommendation suggests that, you know, France should have an OSPO or multiple OSPOs. So can I ask you both um, what you think the biggest challenges 
that you would face in terms of setting up an OSPO in a public sector organizations. They may be the same that might happen in an organization, but I'm guessing that there might be some additional challenges um, in the political context. So, so maybe you can, would, would either of you like to, to, to perhaps have a go at, at answering that question? Bastia, feel free. I'm sure you'll say the same as me. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I would say that there are two challenges. The first one is to recognize diversity and uh, local needs. For example, uh, during the Botoy report, there was a, a consultation run through uh, this DIM, and people expected the French government to have just one forge for every software repository out there. And what we noticed the last two years is that we have more than 20 forges of source codes uh, for uh, public sector source code. And we have many organization uh, accounts on GitHub, on GitLab, everywhere. And we don't think it's time to uh, rationalize and to factorize all this into one single place. So recognizing diversity is um, a, a sense of keeping a sense for the local agencies and the ministries that they own their own politics about open source and that they have to move forward into their own direction. So we are not centralizing everything as we are expected to, to do as French people. And the second challenge, um, but we still have a coordinated plan. So diversity is respected, but still we need to move forward into uh, three goals. One is open more source code, use more free software in the administration and attract uh, new talents, open source talents to work within uh, agencies. The second uh, challenge is about a sense of shyness from public administrations. They don't like to talk about what they use. They don't like to, sometimes they don't even like to speak about what they produce. Even if it's a, a very small and very nice team um, doing a great open source product, uh, there is this culture of shyness. If you take, for example, the uh, anti-COVID uh, application, you don't see the name of the contributors because they all use the same name because they were afraid of going public. So going public is quite a challenge and we need to uh, make progress on this. Thank you. Thank you, Bastien. So, Hayes, were they the same challenges that you faced? Is it, is it, is well, it similar, different? You got extra ones to throw on there? I can neither deny or confirm. No, I think at a higher level, they are the same because we're talking about change management and changing the culture. Um, and I really appreciate what Bastian said about um, the timidity of, of projects. Um, for the commission, we have a similar, we face similar things. So um, let me just give you two examples. We have, we were quite fast in removing one of the stumbling blocks um, in the house where developers are for some reason not able to easily look into the code and components and, and the, the tickets and the help desk things from their colleagues across the teams in other DGs. And uh, so this we fix quite fast, but that's only one part of the problem. The, to change the way they work, to change their culture, to make them look into each other's pro uh, projects, that will take a bit of time. Um, and another barrier that we quite quickly we're sort of able to remove, we're not there yet, is to make it easier to share open source software from the commission with the outside world. So to publish commission source code as open source. So the, the rules have been written. We're just trying to get the paperwork through the machine. That takes a bit of time because of the pandemic, a bit more time than we, than we had hoped. Um, but it's an important barrier. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that we will see enthusiastically tens of projects per year going open. Um, and where, where we differ is um, that in the commission, we tend to really try to uh, rationalize and optimize the way we do these processes. So there's a lot of talking about, um, should we go to this platform? Should we go to that platform? Um, should we centralize? Should we let people free? Again, that's a culture change. And uh, I think that Bastian and I can both agree that the hardest part is to make this open to loosen the rules in an organization such as a government. So, because that's what open source tends to do. 
Yeah, no, th and thank you for that. And I think the diversity kind of point that Bastien makes is such an important one because no matter what you decide, no matter what anyone decides on in any one organization, there'll always be another one. There's always yes. one and you can't yeah, exclude them, right? Because they could have a hugely okay. important. And that's okay. So we just have to and get people okay. to relax yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah, and and hopefully that will even help with the culture change because when people are familiar with their own um, uh, environment, then that can help. So so thank you both for that. Um, I want to touch back now because we've been talking about this idea of the individual challenges and and the actual OSPOs themselves. But uh, one of the things that Aster mentioned in the report summary was this idea of an OSPO network. And um, so I'm going to come back to you, Aster, just to maybe comment about what you mean by that in the context and, and maybe even commenting in the in the context of what Bastien and Hayes was, was talking about earlier. Like, what do you see the value? What's What do you mean by the network and what's the additional value that can provide? Sure, absolutely. And the, the first thing I, I would say here to kind of link it back to, to Hayes and Bastien's work is, um, uh, you know, the internal components, so to say, if we're going to call it that, of the OSPO is extremely important for the capacity building of an organization. Um, you know, one can talk as much as they want about a network, but if the OSPO doesn't bring value to the organization within which it's built, then, you know, you got to get this stuff right uh, uh, to begin with. Um, that said, uh, uh, you we at our think tank, we don't want to shy away from what we think is this very vast potential of uh, uh, finding ways of both informally and formally networking these OSPOs in different sectors, etc. And uh, in many ways, what we hope to see here is what we've seen in the private sector already. Um, OSPOs look very different in different companies. They're in different parts of the companies. They're at companies of very vastly different sizes, and they're both on the vendor side and on the user side. Um, but what we're talking about when talking about networking these OSPOs, it's essentially, and this is something uh, I think any bureaucracy or any organization always looks, looks for, it's increasing organizational interoperability, enabling collaboration, uh, lowering transaction costs between very diverse organizations, which, you know, um, is not necessarily the easiest thing. Um, um, but we believe that um, uh, the OSPO can really help in this, especially together and matched with, let's say, trusted intermediaries um, that uh, can help bringing these nodes together. So, I mean, imagine to paint a little bit of a picture because it can sound very abstract talking about OSPO networks. Imagine you have, a, a, let's say, a city that has an OSPO set up. It's in search of a solution to a, a challenge identified by citizens that, um, let's say, a digital solution can solve. They would then, um, which is also an additional benefit, without having to sign, let's say, tricky contracts or memorandums of uh, uh, understanding, um, be able to collaborate together with a university OSPO um, based on uh, open source licenses as the kind of collaborative framework. Um, at the same time, they could also engage local and for that matter, global companies to participate and support in this development. Um, and you know, then maybe even early in this process as a result of hopefully continuous communication and, and a backbone kind of trusted intermediary that supports the network. Uh, another city OSPO that is faced with a similar uh, uh, challenge can also enter in the conversation. And there is this kind of station, there's this point of entry when talking about open source uh, where the OSPO being named an OSPO can really help. I mean, for an individual developer or a large corporation, it can be very good to know that the European Commission, for example, has the OSPO. So that's a natural point to go and ask about open source for. Uh, and the same goes for a city or a national government. Um, and so here, I also want to say that we're very clear eyed um, when it comes to the, the kind of diff uh, difficulties of just spurring collaboration between very diverse sorts of organizations and stakeholders. It doesn't just happen. Um, that said, uh, we do believe that from the outset, especially because we're talking about this kind of greenfield advantage of starting to really work with OSPOs in the public sector and in academia, for example to have this thinking established from the start, to have this part of the conversation when building them. Because if you look at the private sector, it took probably 15 years or so until uh, more informal networks of collaborations actually were established. Here, 
the government, we could leapfrog this in many different sectors. Um, and I mentioned this earlier on, and this is when it comes to kind of the potential. Um, I think we have to be very realistic when it comes to, you know, we heard about the challenges of, of cultural change and ways of working, et cetera. Um, let's not just run before we can walk. When it comes to talking about large scale, ambitious open source policies in the context of, you know, uh, creating growth, uh, um, really uh, realizing value from open source for citizens, let's take one step at a time. Let's look, do we have the institutional framework in place? Do we have the capacity? Do we have the infrastructure onto which we then can roll out these policies? Because it's very easy to roll out very ambitious policies, but if you don't have this framework in place, it's often, and we, you know, we all know examples of this, they don't get traction in the real world. And the end of the day, we need to connect one, these big policies to citizens, but also individual developers, other companies, universities, it, it, it all needs to come together. So, um, and we think, you know, we have good models for this uh, that we can look at in the private sector, but it's not that simple. There are special needs that we need to take into account for in the public sector as well. But the potential is there. Yeah, and, and I mean, when you think about the network, like, you know, to your point, there may be already models in existence that we can we can look to, but actually you kind of need that network to exist even to, as we go, we're learning. I mean, this is this is new for, as you mentioned, it's Greenfield and many organizations. Um, I don't think even, you know, corporate Osbos have it all figured out yet. So there really needs to be an opportunity to, to actually share those learnings as we go as well um, and to address the challenges that we see cropping up and share the best practices as they come up too. So, so you can see the value of, of a network like that in, in all those instances. So thank you, thank you, Aster. And um, I'll come to you now, Maurizio, because from um, the United Nations perspective, obviously we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, and they're they're kind of the responsibility of everyone to achieve, right? We have a, you know common goals set out for the world. So can you maybe uh, comment on how you think your office can actually use open source to actually help that, to help the development for the, the Sustainable Development Goals? First of all, thank you, Claire, and for the organizer of this panel. I think it's very important. I, I hear and I learn a lot of things. And uh, you know, maybe we are the, the last on the on the blocks here, so we really need to you know keep up. But uh, I really resonate from from a UN perspective to the to the network approach of, of the OSPO and the end, end state of, of having an infrastructure that actually knows how to talk about open source and connect uh, at, at various level. And as the UN, you know, our comp competitive advantage is really the network effect, the ability to, to expand and talk to countries, to, to different di diversity as well, and inclusion as part of, uh, of the process. So, I think, as you said, that the Sustainable Development Goals and the DJA Assembly, the General Assembly Resolution says a very important thing that, you know, it's not only government that needs to implement these goals. It's, it's for us all to do it. All the actors of the society need to, need to concentrate on this. And, you know, this is a clear understanding from everybody you talk to, you know, in, in, uh, you know if you talk to a company, or a university or, or a nation state, everybody understands that the complex solutions that are needed today cannot be done, uh, you know, by themselves. Cannot be, you know, done individually. They need to be interconnected. The challenges are totally beyond, goes beyond the border of the jurisdictions. We need to make sure that we are collaborating together. And so, to achieve the SDG, 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 SGDs is really important to. Uh, um, have open innovation and open culture that spans the the local boundaries of every organization. So, the um, you know the, if the data is the is the new oil for us, definitely open source software is its refinery. So we really need to make sure that we uh, you know uh, adopt. And as uh, the studies that, that we were presented today of the EC says that you know one dollar. Uh, invested in open source produces four dollars in, uh, in in the economy. That is uh, a good enough incentive to bring this uh, instance to the decision makers, and this is what we're really trying to concentrate uh, in, in in our work. And uh, with the, with various entities in the in, in the secretariat, including the Tech Envoy Office, the Digital Public uh, Goods Alliance, the inspiration that is coming from the European Commission, we're really trying to work on establishing OSPO for, for the United Nations and for the Secretariat. So um, 
as you know, we you know all big organization has been working on, on open source for, for years. You know, I think we have 1,238 Linux servers at this point uh, running the, the, the work of the UN. So we've been using uh, you know open source solutions. We've been we, our official website is on Drupal. So we have 500 more websites on Drupal. So there's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of uh, um, you know understanding of the value of this, but this is really scattered throughout the organization. And uh, we've been talking to, to many of these uh, colleagues uh, that we now call them open source heroes, because these are really the heroes in the organization that are trying to put forward uh, uh, these instances of making sure that open source is uh, used to, this, to the fullest benefit. But indeed, they, what, what they're telling us is they need a central coordination and a function, a, an in, in institutionalized function for them to reach out, find in, information, talk the open source uh, um, you know, policies, strategies, implementations uh, that, that need to be uh, you know, followed for, for the UN to really uh, engage in the digital public good uh, uh, arena. Because we have, as uh, the, the EC has, a lot of software that were developed uh, maybe uh, internally uh, that could be open sourced and could be leveraged uh, uh, for, for the for the wider communities, open source communities. Of course, you know, we have challenges and uh, like everybody else, I think uh, I subscribe to the ones that I heard already. But of course, in, also in large organization, the bureaucracy takes time. And, and this is not necessarily bad because we really need to think it through and really need to build the capacity. We really need to talk the, the, the walk the talk, uh, as we say. And uh, we really need to find the uh, senior uh, decision makers on, on the ball with, on this and, and making the right decision. And in, at the end of the day, you know, change management is really what, what is the, the, the major problem that we, we are facing at, at, at this point. We're trying to attack that through a bottom-up approach with, with concrete solution that we put out and we start learning from you know, engaging with the community and a top-down approach from the policymaker to, to um, uh, meet in the center and really change the culture of, of the organization. So that's really our end goal and our challenge at the same time. And, and Maurizio, a lot of those challenges seem similar to the ones that Bastien and Hayes have, have, have described in terms of actually changing the culture, change management internally um, within the UN. Um, can you maybe speak to as well any practical steps then you'd be thinking about in the context of actually interacting with or engaging with other city or or, or um, country level OSBOs? Like, how are, are, have you got plans in that area um, in terms of actually helping that adoption or to do those collaborations? Is that something that is all also on your playbook? Indeed, it's uh, this, this approach and the, the network approach that we were discussing before is really, you know, the end goal that we want to achieve. Of course, we are recognized that, you know, before to get before, you know, running, we need to start walking. And so this is where we are at this point. And um, we have a, a kind of engineer a three tier approach to try to attack the and, and, and achieve the, the end goal. And first of all, we really need to build uh, you know capacity internally making sure that we know what we're talking about we know that we have we, uh, we have functions and procedures and and and, uh, and policies and strategies that really uh, govern this, this work and this is where we are you know piggybacking on uh, on our colleagues and the, and and in the ec and other organization to make sure that we are not making the same mistakes that they 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 did so we are leap, leapfrogging you know those those mistakes the second tier is really try to engage with all the, the, the biggest family of, of, the, of, of the UN, all the funds and programs. And uh, we have uh, Mala here, who's, who's we know is, is doing work with WHO. And we actually, we are talking very closely to see if it, she, they can also help us on, on that particular tier. But the, the most important part that, and probably the most difficult part is really to, to engage at member state level, to, to be able to uh, leverage the UN um, competitive advantages we were talking about before to connect, you know, different um, uh, countries, different cities, of course, and different administrations to talk the same, uh, you know, uh, to discuss the same uh, open source uh, agenda, making sure that we have maybe a strategy and, and a policy at, at the UN level. We have resolutions that could talk about that. We actually had a resolution a few weeks ago from ECOSOC about requesting the uh, Secretary General to come up with a with a report on how the UN can assist um, the the open source community and engaging with member states on the open source agenda. So indeed, next year the 
the secretary will be in, busy in, in, in looking at, uh, at this report and providing guidance of that. So indeed, uh, you know, it's a three-tier approach that works in parallel, and we are all trying to, to put our priorities where, where we see the, the most impact at this, at this point. But again, uh, one of the key issues here is really to, to build awareness among the decision makers and being able to demonstrate with hard evidence that uh, there is value in, in the open source. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Maurizio. And, and I'll come to you now, Mala. Um, as, as Maurizio mentioned, uh, you've had a lot of experience working with organizations like the WHO. Um, can, can you maybe comment as well, uh, apart from the sustainable development goals, you know, for when you think about tech for social good, what part to play, I mean, does open source obviously has a huge part to play, but what part to play do OSPOs also can play in the context of, of tech for social good at that global level? Yeah, I mean, I have to echo everything that my fellow panelists have said. Um, I'm a designer by training. So before I joined GitHub a couple of years ago, I was the person who worked for the UN and basically designed the tools that they would implement in whichever country. And I have a lot of lived experience with just the challenge and frustration of being a design team of one with one engineer across 30 countries. And a lot of people promising me that we're gonna do this project, but then just not getting the resources. So I think one of the challenges that we see throughout the UN system and with USAID and the UN Foundation and all of these organizations that have rightly called out that open source is a really critical component of tech for social good, of tech for you know, any part of advancing equity and human development is really just the technical and the tactical side. What tools do you use? Which developers do you hire? You know, how do you set your budgets up? And I think those are some of the gaps that we've been able to fill through our work with the World Health Organization this past year and a half. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work with them to just understand where their current teams are with open source. And of course, as you would expect for an organization that large, and especially with everything happening around COVID, there are teams that are just thinking about it and teams that are really just have one or two barriers that need to be knocked down. And so I think an OSPO has a role to play in, in basically all of those areas. Um, from the work that we've done so far, you know, I think a lot of the, the topics that my panel has covered, especially around change management, are really important with OSPOs. But then we're also identifying some areas that I think are quite unique to international organizations, multinational organizations like the UN. For example, you know, if you have a license, for instance, like which jurisdiction is that actually enforced under if you're a UN organization? And then how do you work for a five-year strategy when you've got a budget that's supposed to roll up to that five-year strategy when you have a very clear process to buy a hundred dollar license, but not to allocate a hundred dollars or ten thousand dollars or whatever amount to documentation and open source? And so we're identifying all of these little challenges. And I think the, the tough part now really is to prioritize that and say, obviously everybody needs help with everything. So how do we prioritize and figure out what we address first? Um, I think that's ultimately a question that WHO is gonna have to make, but we're helping them kind of build up that evidence and try to think through you know, how to prioritize those points. Um, you know, I think a second point that's just really interesting, especially coming from the UN system, and then we're now working at an, a company, GitHub, that's very critical to open source, but also based in San Francisco and through and through an American company. You know, we have developers in pretty much every country in the world, but a critical mass in North America. You know, thinking about tech companies, they can really only hire in like 30 to 40 countries around the world. So we're limited to North America, we're limited to Europe, but in the UN, you know, my colleagues are from everywhere, grew up everywhere, based everywhere. You know, you can talk to people about a specific tribe in a specific country and the differences therein, right? So when you talk about international perspectives, then it gets really, 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 you know, micro, it gets really localized. And so I think a UN OSPO has a really critical role to play in just being able to hire developers in Africa, simple as it sounds, yeah. you know, we need to make open source more equitable. That's a huge challenge that we've had, you know, the history of open source is, it's tough, you know, it was exclusionary for a while. And I think now people are starting to understand that history and how it plays out. But when you're talking about movements such as the digital public goods and, you know, the DPGA, the Digital Public Goods Alliance with UNICEF, Lucy Harris's work, they're doing amazing work, but they know that it's a challenge to make it more equitable. And so one of the challenges that we have at GitHub and then working with WHO and other UN agencies that are really thinking about an OSPO is how can you bring in a more equitable approach? And as a designer, that really speaks to me, right? Inclusionary design to make sure that digital public goods, which majorly are servicing people in low and middle income countries are actually built by people in low and middle income countries. You know, so there's a lot of, I think, economic and social aspects that a OSPO at the UN could eventually think about and the network of OSPOs as Mauricio was talking about. I think those challenges are probably a couple years out, uh, but at least at the beginning, 
we can start with the more tactical approaches of who do you hire them? Why do you hire them? How do you pay them? What are they doing? How do they work together? What tools are they using, et cetera? So I think once we can get to kind of the, that more basic level, then we can start to go for more of those higher level topics that ultimately I think we're all trying to, to work towards. No, thank you for that. And and when we're thinking about that kind of global impact or even just being the inclusionary, and I, I know I know we were saying that in many respects, uh, you know, some of the the large corporations are actually, you know, from a smaller group of countries. But when we think about the corporations as well, who also many of whom do have a, a global footprint, if, if not like as global as we would like it in the future. Can can either of you, perhaps uh, Maurizio or Mala, or in fact anyone on the panel, like comment about how a network of OSPOs for, from a public sector um, administrations and organizations like the UN, like is there a role to play with networking also with corporate OSPOs in that respect, in terms of potentially having, um, I don't know, in the context of corporate social responsibility, like is, is there an opportunity for that also to happen? Yeah, I definitely think there is, you know, a lot of OSPOs in the corporate sector do focus on tooling, for instance. So if you're mm -hmm. using a piece of open source, then how do you like automatically detect that and make sure you're staying compliant with the license? Mm -hmm. I think that kind of concern is something that we hear quite often. So there's some countries that WHO works in that are very pro open source and they want to work with, for example, the French government to strengthen that. In other cases, they categorically know we're not going to do, do this, at least not yet. And so some of those concerns do come down to the actual technology and for the fact that, again, you might have one developer for every 30 program officers at the UN, yeah. you need that capacity from the corporations to really say, all right, so I understand this is a challenge, but is there actually a technical solution to at least start to address some of those issues? So yeah, I definitely think there's, there's um, work to be done there. And also, I just think the network effect, you know, one great thing about open source, open, open doesn't mean equal. And I do want to stress that point, you know, it doesn't mean equal, but it does mean that in, in theory, people do have the opportunity to engage. And so I think there are a lot of roles that, you know, corporate OSPOs can play, and that's exactly what we're doing. So, you know, GitHub is owned by Microsoft and our Microsoft OSPO and our GitHub OSPO are, you know, working side by side with WHO in these coming months to really help stand up some of these like critical pieces of infrastructure that they would need. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. So I suppose then one of the question, and, and I'll open this up to all the panelists again. Um, you know, there, there, there are many groups out there who have been working on the areas of, of uh, shared learnings around OSPOs. Folks like the Two Group have lots of great resources about how to get started with your OSPO and, and, and provide those a lot of those resources. Are there particular needs for public sector? I mean, Mala touched on some of them, but can maybe any of any of the rest of you want to comment on the idea of whether there are like what 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 do you need in terms of kind of assets or shared resources or learning or tooling? And I'll, I'll make it really broad. If if you all could help each other, what what ask would you put on the table? <laughs> May I start with this one? Yeah, go right ahead, Bastian. Uh... <laughs> I, is it I a long will, list? <laughs> no, no, it's a very short list. I mean, we need, uh, at least from a political point of view, we need the stability. Uh, so my my first wish would be for the French OSPO to exist in the next 10 years. And then we are not, and then open source has a steady strategy that can develop, uh, develop itself. And and, and be nurtured by the network of relations with other agencies. Uh, one word about this uh, networking, uh, that's why this action plan exists, is that because we started to have partnerships with this other uh, ministry, this other agency, and this other one, and then we need to gather all this into one single institution for one action plan. And that, uh, that's also the case for uh, corporate OSPO or corporate just companies. We need to have a place where we can articulate the way we work together on uh, reaching the goals that we have for the administration. Uh, it's not for the company to set our goals. It's the administration, the public sector sets the goal, the government sets the goal, but how can we work together to uh, achieve them? And this takes time. Uh, and so my first wish would be to have time to develop and then, of course, um, more uh, diverse people uh, to share them, their experience and their knowledge of open source within their technical expertise, within their uh, coming from companies 
uh, explaining how their OSPO work uh, worked in the company and so on and so on. And hopefully, and hopefully also from the the emerging uh, French OSPO, so that they can get over their shyness too. So we sure. like, we'll all do the, the 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 mutual sharing. That would be fantastic. So does anyone else have so so sharing experiences? A magic wand to create more time and and, and instability uh, for Bastien, though that will come with time. Um, anyone else got any ideas about what what the, the a network could come together to actually create to actually help uh, public sector OSPOs? Um, you know, I think one thing is just kind of level setting expectations. I think there's mm -hmm. the sense with open source that if I build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true, but it, who cares? You know, if you have five people who look at your tool and they're five people from other governments, then that's probably what you need, right? It doesn't matter necessarily about the quantity or the volume of people contributing. Yeah. And a lot of what we see with open source in the social sector really is around that transparency. So you can imagine you know, if you're working with somebody who's got a limited budget, it's it's a big deal if somebody duplicates 20 hours of work or $100,000 in funding. So just knowing that a tool already exists and not reinventing the wheel itself is already important, even if they don't necessarily contribute to that. So I think a network of OSPOs can kind of level set expectations on what open source is, what the real advantages are in the social and public sectors, and then also help with that culture change at the top level. You know, I think there is, it's, it's tough because when you work in, tech for social good, you understand pretty quickly that the tech is a very small portion of the solution and that's okay. It's increasingly important, but the policies, the systemic biases, the just the, the ability for people to thrive in economies and ask people who they are and with respect to human rights is really where that core of that work lies. But tech is increasingly important. And so UN and other organizations need to understand that by proxy, they are becoming tech service providers. That is part of their job. And so we need to adapt things that are, you know, well-known kind of standard bearers, things that are working in the private sector where possible, even if you have to change some things here and there. And OSPOs are one of them. You know, they're, every single major corporation that builds technology either has an OSPO or is probably thinking about one now. So there's a reason for that. And I think if the UN just kind of wraps their head around that and other social sector organizations wraps their head around that and gets the buy-in at the top level, then the funding and then the personnel, you know, the staff will come with that. No, that, that's great. And, and I think that, you know, even having, be, being able to take those learnings um, from the non-tech sector and bring them closer to the tech community at large um, will have, I mean, that surely would have a benefit for the entire industry uh, as well as as well as the tech social good aspect. Aster, you had your hand up there. Do you want to pop in and, and make a comment? And then, hey, San yes. Mauricio too. <laughs> Super quick. There's one thing, uh, I'm not going to speak to exactly what uh, the public sector needs, but I think also one thing that is important to keep in mind, now it's a bit bit Eurocentric because that's what we work with. But uh, the European Commission, for example, has been engaged in encouraging the sharing and reuse of software products between uh, governments for many years. It's, there's an established uh, program under the ISA squared um, uh, initiative. And uh, so it's also important to not kind of connected to not reinventing the, the wheel. There is a lot of experience. There's a lot of things that have been done. There are a lot of good models to build on and share more globally and bring those up. And again, I think the OSPO conversation is to a large extent just about taking that next step. Uh, critically look at how the processes work and decreasing those uh, transaction costs and then finding ways of sharing the best practices globally uh, from how these things are done. Um, and for also us to be you know, have the humility to listen to how other countries and other uh, networks and collaborations have worked to also bring that into how, uh, how we do things in, in Europe. Excellent point, Esther. Thank you very much. Hayes, you were also uh, waving there earlier. Yeah, it, I, what I wanted to add is um, um, I agree with uh, Bastien that time is actually quite es essential. Um, but there is a natural thing that happens here because that organizations such as the commission and many others, if I look at the number of uh, requests for information to talk and present, we have received from member state public services. Many of these public services realize how open source is strategic and it's a very natural fit to public uh, services. Um, and in fact, together with the European Parliament, the, the commission OSPO is, and I can't really talk too much about it because we're still fleshing out all the details, but we're going to start this big project to, to, to build an information network. So th the goal there is to allow public services to, to share, reuse, to pool, 
resources, knowledge, ideas, practices, because it's a contribution to society, it's cost savings to, to the citizens, and it makes things so much easier um, in an organization such as the European Union. And it's the only way for the European Union to capitalize on this network effect, and open source is such a practical tool. So this is going to happen for sure. We look forward to hearing more about that. And um, thank you, Hayes. And, and Maurizio, you also had a comment to make? Yes, just, just a very quick one. I mean, from, from a very high you know, perspective, the open source language for me resonates very well to the, with the Charter of the UN and the Charter of what, of what we should be doing here. And, and what we should be doing is to bring in people together, talking to each other. And if my, one of my asks is that the open source language would be the same in all countries in the world so that we could then talk to each other and understand each other much better. So that, that's my wish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, we have come to the end of our time, which is always too short when we get to talk to these wonderful people. Um, but I would love to thank our fabulous panelists here today. Thank you, Aster. Thank you, Hayes. Thank you, Maurizio. Thank you, Mala. Thank you, Bastien. Um, it's been a fantastic uh, discussion. Um, I want to leave the audience with, I suppose, maybe two things. One is if you are perhaps in a public sector, OSPO, or thinking about that, or um, want to network with more of these wonderful people, um, you know, do check out the OSPO++ network. Uh, we hold monthly monthly calls, community calls, and, and, and we'd love to hear from you. I think that the, the next one is September 30th, which I think maybe tomorrow when this is played. Um, but check it out on ospoplus.com. I will also say that, um, you know, I would put a call out really for everyone who may not be in a public sector organization, but actually maybe in a corporate OSPO to have a think about how you and your organization can potentially add to this network effect that we've discussed um, and the potential there, because, you know, there really is an opportunity for us all to come together now to, to look at the global problems, to look at the local problems, um, but, but to actually deliver real value to citizens beyond, uh, beyond the idea of, of, of just creating technology uh, for an industry or private sector. Um, and, and this is what this opportunity presents for all of us. So I'd, I'd call Call on all of you to uh, to hopefully have a think about how you can work together in the future, and maybe your OSPO can network with some other public sector OSPOs to have an even greater impact in the world. Um, but with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, and I'm hoping you're all having a fantastic time in OSPOCon. And I wish I was there. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.